Hello and welcome to Tech Equipment's live webinar on YouTube. Today streamed on the 9th of July. If you're watching this on demand, the things you can look forward to today are as we take you through different elements of uncommon mechanical engineering theory and explain how they can be taught using a practical teaching element. Uh, my name is Dion Knowles. I'm the marketing manager at Tech Equipment, and today I'm also joined by Kyle Hatchard. Kyle, are you there? I am. Hi, Dion. Just uh, finished my baked beans and ready to go. So uh, yeah. no spinaches, or have you already changed your shirt? <laughs> no, I wasn't wearing my shirt at that point. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a bit like me. W quick change out of the hoodie into a something presentable. Absolutely. We are getting, uh, we were just chatting before we came live, everybody who's watching us, how we were talking about, we we're going up to the wire, literally running around two minutes before we've gone live, getting changed, doing our hair. Uh, there's the beauty of working from home. We're becoming pros at it now, Dion. So. We are, it's, it's, uh, it's a good job, <laughs> given everything that's going on at the moment. We've got lots of exciting stuff happening at Tech Equipment. A bit of that I can allude to later on, um, but I'll, I'll be teasing you, I'm afraid. You'll have to be watching this space as we share more on that. I first of all want to say, give a few shout outs to people. I'm looking over my other screen here and I can see we've got James Bower, we've got Semi here, we've got Bruno joining as well, as there as well. Please do, if you're watching this live, let us know where you're watching from and who you are. We'll give you a quick shout out. This is live, so it means that we can engage with you live in the moment as we go through the content. So do feel free to post your questions and I'll interrupt Kyle because Kyle is the man on the spot today taking us through Uncommon Theory. So let's jump straight in there, Kyle. I'm, many of you already know who Tech Equipment are. For those who don't, wait on a little while after Kyle's talked about the Uncommon Theory, and I'll tell you a little bit more about us. But I really want to delve straight in the, into the content today. Kyle, over to you now. Smashing. Thanks, Dion. Um, so obviously, you know, we provide a range of equipment for mechanical engineering. Um, and, you know, a lot of those fundamental theories, are, well, repeat themselves in very many sort of different forms. Um, but you know you often see a pattern as well in regards to areas that people focus on um, and also there's areas that people don't tend to focus on um, and really we thought it would be quite interesting for people perhaps to get an understanding of some of the equipment that we provide that will allow students to involve themselves from a practical context in equipment that's you know not typical um, of a laboratory um, environment and how you'd perhaps use those in the real world um, and obviously the benefits for the student in investigating these different theories as well. So if we move into the first unit on the discussion, so yeah, let's go straight into it. We've got the positive displacement pump module, the MFP 103. Um, so this is really quite a versatile standalone unit um, that allows the use of um, four different modules, these being a piston pump, a gear pump, a vein pump, and a swash plate pump. So a piston pump effectively is a PDP pump, which is a positive displacement pump. Um, you've also got a series of obviously centrifugal and progressive cavity pumps, PCP, pumps in the marketplace that are used. However, PDP pumps um, would include things like compressors, pressurizing the chamber or gas and moving liquids under high pressure, such as um, in an oil and gas field, for example, where you can see the nodding donkeys in Texas that are extracting oil from the ground. That's where piston pumps would be used. Um, and experiments include investigating how the shaft power increases and flow decreases depending on the delivery pressure. So that allows students get a real understanding of how effective piston pumps can be used and obviously what type of applications they would be used in. Um, it also gives you a slight understanding as well into things like slenderness ratios and how you know the relationship between the shaft length and the diameter 
and how you affect those then affects the characteristics of the pump itself. And it also allows students to familiarize themselves with the idea of pump curves. So the best efficiency point uh, in a curve, so where you've got the header X along a curve, along a graph, for example, or flow along the Y, um, you can obviously then understand where your best efficiency point is in relation to that particular pump characteristic and operation. So then you move into the gear pump, um, and these are utilized typically where accurate dosage is required, for example, in paint or even chocolate plants. Obviously, chocolate plants want to make sure that they're producing chocolate and issuing Oh my gosh, Kyle, that is so very important. So we yes. need to spend some time on this one. Yeah, I need I need pick up on that then, Dio. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, they can they can obviously as, as well work under extremely high pressures um, in the region of like 500 bar plus, um, not particularly obviously for that piece of equipment that you can see in front of you. These are just purposely for um, demonstrating the principles of how a gear pump operates. Um, but nonetheless, they are very effective in helping students understand how these different types of gear pumps and piston pumps operate from an efficiency point of view. So you move then into the vein pump. So this is used maybe in a vacuum pump, for example, rotary vein pumps, you would typically call them. Um, I've come across them in my career in regards to extracting um, or used in dental surgeries, um, vacuum vein pumps. Um, so it's basically used for extracting fluids at a relatively high pressure. Um, and it allows the students to understand how the volumetric space affects the efficiency in relationship with flow and analyzing how the increase in pressure requires higher shaft power and increases in efficiency. So obviously there's multiple uses for a piece of equipment like that and again it's an ideal piece of equipment for allowing students to explore that principle. Again now we move on to swash plate pumps. So a swash plate pump is a relatively new invention in terms of things um and uh, quite a unique way of creating a, a, a pressure um increase and in this instance it allows the flow to remain constant and proves very useful in applications where you require 100 percent volumetric efficiency and delivery um a situation where that would be critical would perhaps be in a hydraulics um platform where obviously if you were supporting a structure or some kind of some form of um, pressure for some kind of support that would be essential in ensuring that you've got 100 percent delivery um, so yeah obviously it also comes with the vdas equipment so that allows students to extract that data from a digital perspective and obviously carry out varying different um, investigations with the results so yeah, that's pretty much on the MFP 103, Dion, um, for now. If we move into the, I think we've got the Venturi um, system there, the H400. Um, so effectively, this is understanding uh, Bernoulli's equation um, and has some surprising implications in regards to how that then behaves in a Venturi. Um, so considering fluid flow through a horizontal pipe, as the pipe narrows through the venturi at one spot, um, then along the rest of the pipe, by, a, by applying the continuity equation, the velocity of the fluid is greater in the narrow section. So this means that the pressure is higher or lower in the narrow section and where the velocity increases. So the velocity would increase um, as pressure decreases. Um, so you could perhaps imagine if you were stepping off a, a, a train, for example, uh, into a busy platform, and then everybody came to the set of stairs. Uh, generally, um, everyone becomes tighter, um, and in that instance, the particular fluid would then increase in velocity um, through a venturi, for example. Um, so, yeah, basically, the de decrease in pressure results in an increase in velocity. Um, and um, it simply occurs with fluids and how then cavitation then uh, unfolds inside, for example, a pump housing. Um, this particularly causes damage to an impeller, for example, um, where it would eat away the material itself. Um, and 
it would cause obviously you know alternative effects as a result of that through that system whether that's into the bearing or um you know the, the motor itself um so yeah obviously understanding cavitation is incredibly important for an engineer um and effectively what cavitation is is the formation of bubbles um in a very crude fashion as the vol sort of velocity increases due to the pressure decrease and these bubbles effectively they, they implode on themselves and believe it or not um at the speed of sound and as a result there's a huge temperature that's created around 4000 degrees in the center of that bubble um and this causes the phenomenon known as as cavitation and you can see on the display there you've got a, a quite a colorful little creature um which is a pistol shrimp and that utilizes cavitation to send a shock wave um through to its prey um and obviously uses it in a defense mechanism as well um but that is an incredibly powerful little animal um that utilizes uh, bubbles of air effectively to fire through the water um to to obviously impact on um its prey and the same incidents actually happens when you've got a pump in operation and cavitation is occurring so it's quite an interesting phenomenon to for students to explore and the h400 is a brilliant piece of equipment that allows you to do that effectively so, fascinating thank you yeah, Carl. that's all right good so um, next we get to talk about uh, when uh, when it's willing to cooperate is more on pumps it is. So I think we're moving into um, more sort of centrifugal pump modules here. Um, and centrifugal pumps are probably, well, they're not probably, they're most definitely are the most common pump type in the world. Um, and they're typically used in all sorts of applications, whether it's from domestic solutions or through to industrial pumping applications or simply from, you know, a hot tub in the garden, for example, that will use to lies a centrifugal pump to increase its the fluid velocity and increase the, the fluid's pressure thus allowing you to transfer fluids from a low point or to a high point um, so exactly what's included within this piece of equipment we have a pelton wheel set up so you can understand and investigate the efficiencies or different efficient type the most efficient types of um, impeller type um in regards to turbines um and also a francis turbine and also an impeller which allows students to explore the efficiencies with these different types of designs and they're interchangeable within that unit um, and you can obviously also see and visualize what's happening within the point of, of the impeller itself um so yeah that's a really quite versatile piece of equipment dion that allows students to again uh, touch on different efficiencies within um, pumping, centrifugal pump operation. Brilliant. If um, people are in, more interested on that, we've got some nice videos of students using it um, on our student competition playlist. So go and check that out. Now, these are more, uh, more recently introduced products uh, from our range that we introduced last year both the series and parallel pumps and the variable speed series and parallel pumps bench top test set. Yeah, they're great pieces of kit, Dion. And do you know what, from a, you know, from a pumping perspective, you can, you know, obviously demonstrate how a series and, and parallel pumps operate and also demonstrate again, cavitation. And you can see ever so slightly there, the right hand image where cavitation is taking place on that first pump. Um, and again, that allows you to extract data into our VDAS system and analyze the results, um, things like temperature, um, the, obviously the uh, pressures and the different outlets from each pump as well, and pressures on the inlet. Um, so yeah, really quite a good little system to be honest with you. And also bench top, so nice and easy to store from a storage perspective too. Having, having worked with the engineers on the live launch that we did uh, last year, I could just really testify how easy and how beautiful, um, you know, it's noisy at times, you can hear the cavitation, um, but yeah, it, it's fantastic and it's quite versatile because we've got the one end, which is the H52, which is 
very much uh, analog uh, sorry, not analog, uh, basic dial based um, functionality. And then you can, if you want extended functionality and look at variable speeds, then you can use the H53V, which has got extra sensors in there to look at, uh, to analyze things further. Yeah, absolutely. Great point, Nadia. Right. Like it's decided that he wants to take us back to the beginning. So we're catching up once more. And uh, you can tell it's See it clearly tell, um, cracking under the stress. Well, there you go, stress and strain analysis. Stress and strain analysis, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this diaphragm experiment basically, SM1008, um, allows students to investigate um, how a thin aluminium alloy plate. Um, is sandwiched between two heavy rings and it provides the diaphragm with um, built-in edge conditions uh, a little similar really to how perhaps um, a drum skin mounts to um, the shell of a drum for example. And um, Kyle is a drummer so oh, you should know. Yeah they're all they're in boxes still to be on so they've oh, not been dear. set up for a while um, <laughs> but yeah it would be nice. So Anyway, the, uh, the user then slides a digital scale and digital indicator across the surface of the diaphragm um, to measure its deflected cross-sectional sh shape when a pressure is applied. Um, so this effectively then uses strain gauges to measure the circumferential and radial stress or strain at three points in reference to the radius. Um, and it really introduces students into understanding and calculating things like Poisson's ratio, um, which is the decrease in the material's cross section as you stretch it. Um, so Poisson's ratio we come into later on as well when trying to understand how journal bearings operate. So again, a piece of equipment like this from a materials perspective really allows students to get to grips with how and why materials behaving in certain ways when you apply them under certain conditions. Um, so really, again, it's a quite a tiny, you know, uh, bench top, um, suitable piece of equipment that's, you know, allows students to really investigate this theory, really. So yeah, really, if you want to move on to the next one, Dion, is that all right? Oh. All oh, right. Okay. So we are back. We so lost I, you. You did lose me. I have returned. I was lost in the ether. Here we are again. Sorry, Kyle. <laughs> Sorry, everybody watching. We are, we returned to talk about strain gauge positioning. Or maybe you've oh. already covered it. We, we did a little bit. We, I got to the radius point. Now, whether, whether everybody heard me or not, I don't know. So, um, we can quickly run through that again. So basically the piece of equipment, again, you've got the VDAS set up there um, that allows you to extract the information from the strain gauges that are set up on the um, face of the diaphragm itself um, and extract the data. Um, so obviously it investigates things like Poisson's ratio and um, the decrease in the materials cross section as you stretch it effectively. And it's really important from the perspective that we'll come on to that later in regards to journal bearings and how that particular calculation is critical to understanding how journal bearings operate effectively in their environment. Remind me, uh, Kyle, Poisson's ratio. Yeah. Summary of that one. So it's, it's the decrease in materials cross section as you stretch the material effectively. So. Brilliant. Thank you. All right, uh, let's move on now. Talking of materials. Yeah, so double shear. So why is it not say single shear, Dion? Do you know? Uh, I, at the back of my mind, I have it in my mind, but I've forgotten because I remember doing the video on it. Um, right. it it's not coming to the front of my mind no, now. No, it's all right. The reason <laughs> it says double shear is because of the way that it is clamped effectively. So it's 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 clamped either side of the material. If it was a single shear, you'd have um, the, uh, the clamping would be either, would be on top of each other and then the pin would be through the middle. Um, whereas this has a clamping either side and um, obviously then you, you would then investigate how the shear effect affects the material. Um, so um, cylindrical speci specimens are used in this 
incident um, and um, single shear means, like I've said before, that across sections having an unbalanced force on uh, either side and it is ineffective to take the effective load effectively um, and then it fails under single shear but then for double shear it's an unbalanced load acting on both sides where the whole section is failed and that's why it's called double shear and not single shear if that makes sense so hopefully you follow me where um, would that be in the real world i remember writing the script when we launched this but i've forgotten how would yeah. you see that in the real world so a, a double shear would be um you'd see it in obviously all structural members um where um you, you know you'd have um you know a, a structure that's supported at the bottom via a pin either side um and then single shear is quite easy to remember because what every time you cut a piece of paper with a pair of scissors you're not cutting that piece of paper you're shearing the piece of paper so yeah that's that's the uh that's sort of the you know real world applications really that i i would suggest so thank you um, below it, we've got the beam and leaf spring. Um, so leaf springs, they're typically used in heavy goods vehicles, or maybe, for example, you might see them on uh, the back of a pickup where you're obviously applying uh, heavy loads. Um, the leaves are, are denoted by the springs, or the, the springs themselves are, are, are called leaves, effectively, um, the, the sheets of metal that you see there. And that makes up the leaf um within the experiments and students can see how the force is then applied to the leaves um as they're displaced or deflect deflected within the sm1000 unit um, as you apply a load through that um, the beam length and deflection um, of a simply supported beam also um is an, an investigation that's that's possible with this piece of equipment and um is you know, not a necessarily uncommon theory, but obviously it comes part of this solution. So leaf springs from the perspective that it's an uncommon uh, theory to investigate uh, is quite a good one to, to know about really. And again, it's all VDAS operated as well. So you can access the VDAS through, um, through a, a laptop or, or similar. Um, so we're moving into understanding materials and plastic bending of portals. So this is the R R STR-16. Um, it consists of specimen, uh, uh, steel specimens um, arranged in a portal frame, and it's held by two fixing blocks um, either at the bottom there. You can see uh, the two blocks, as you can see, Dion's waving the mouse around them, um, and a series of load cells that measure then the deflection as you traverse um, a digital indicator. Once you apply the loads via the force, uh, the load force meters either side, um, as you can see on the right and the top right. Um, and these cause the frame to deflect. So a portal frame structure, um, well, it can be defined as two dimensional rigid frames um, that are the basic characteristics of a, a rigid joint between a column and a beam, for example. Um, and the main objective of this um, form of design is to reduce bending moments of the beam, um, which allows the frame to act as one structural unit effectively. Um, so, you, you know, you're analysing the bending moments of the beam in this case. Um, and again, um, all integrated within our structure software and allows students to investigate the theory in um, also a lab sense or also from the structure software you can access that on your desktop um, at home remotely too. Great, thank you very much. The next. Hopefully, hopefully this is go. interesting for people Dion and it's not boring them to tears. Well it's, it's if it's not interesting for them it's fascinating for me. Right. Uh, so I appreciate it, Kyle. Right, okay. <laughs> Let's hope everyone else does as well. So do let us know if you're watching this live, when you're finding this interesting, if you want us to move on quicker, uh, then uh, put that in the chat box too. All right. Um, let's talk about friction now. And yeah, so absolutely. So this is this is where it gets interesting, really. The TE96, so understanding friction and an air bearing um, apparatus. Uh, you know, contact bearings effectively. Um, these, this is where 
it was trying to understand the world of bearings really so um contact bearings this is where two points of contact um, are moving against each other and generating heat and sound and often cause uh, dirt to get trapped so bearings are utilized in most things that rotate from your car wheel to an industrial pump or maybe even a motor housing um fluid bearings um these utilize fluid between the moving surfaces um and in order to reduce the friction and wear and dependent on the property of the fluid used depends on how that obviously lubricates the bearing so um you could argue that it operates similar to that of maybe a mechanical seal uh, in regards to fluid bearings where you would have two surfaces that are basically pushed apart by the hydrodynamic lift of the fluid between them. Um, whereas an air bearing utilizes the air as the working fluid. Um, and that then in effect lowers, uh, well, if you've got a lower viscosity fluid, um, the lower the friction coefficient um, for the bearing um, operation. So, for example, air bearings are used in high speed dental drills um, uh, to ensure smooth and refined operation at very high speed and where precision is paramount and obviously uses compressed air to um, provide the delivery for that air bearing um, and um, ensuring the correct operation of that air bearing requires obviously um, sufficient um, the, the, the surfaces are kept um, apart sufficiently and therefore the load on the bearing is, is important to understand. This piece of apparatus allows students to really investigate how that load is affected in the bearing um, and obviously the impact on the efficiency. Um, it relies heavily on understanding um, the boundary layer within that bearing uh, rather than providing a high pressure um, air supply and obviously then you know to provide the the, the un important understanding in regards to the cavity and lubrication and how the relationship between the shaft speed increases and how the boundary layer increases um, however as you vary the load this also allows students to understand what happens in this area as well um, so in summary understanding the length to diameter ratio of the bearing um, the load ratio and compressibility of the fluid in this instance is air is critical to obviously then understanding how air bearings are utilized in the field and from that theory perspective. And again, you can use, you can extract your information that you gather from the equipment into the VDAS system. Um, you can understand and investigate things like eccentricity um, and that's effectively how the bearing sits or locates itself within the diameter um, of the housing um, and obviously the matters that affect that. So yeah, that's pretty much really um, a little summary on the air bearing apparatus. Um, then we move into the Hertz, what is it, Hertzian contact apparatus. So Heinrich Hertz, who's very obviously well known for understanding and developing theory around Hertz or frequency. Um, he left that and investigated um, the uh, electro, electro, instead of investigating electromagnetic waves, he then moved into studying sort of more material mechanics and material science. Um, and this particular unit then allows students to demonstrate the relationship um, between two surfaces that are forced together and with the deformation of the two surfaces so again you, you, you've got a Poisson's ratio effect coming into play um, as the two forces are applied and as those um, atoms are energized effectively um, this the material is, is effectively forced in different directions um, and uh, obviously changes shape so it consists uh, of an easily deformed plastic material for magnified and repeatable results. And students are given the Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio of that material. Um, and typically as the pressure increases on the material, the displacement increases in perpendicular directions. So that really summarizes 
the Hertzian contact apparatus and theory. So what's going on in this piece of apparatus, Carl? I'm, I'm not that familiar with it. So this middle bit here that I'm waving the mouse over, is that the plastic deformed bit of material? Yeah, so, so as as you yeah, so as you as you deform or apply a pressure from underneath, yeah. you can analyze how that uh, material um, is then deformed um, as a result of that pressure um, and how that displace, displaces um, increase it, displacement increases um, in perpendicular to the direction of the material, if that makes sense. Okay, so you can, can you then see that on the dial? And is this the magnetic area you're talking about at the top? Can you look down and actually visualise what's happening on the surface? It's, yeah, not magnetic, but it's magnified. So yeah. Sorry, you, magnified, yes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Um, so yeah, and obviously, you know, you can generate repeatable results then as well. So yeah. Um, Good. But, you know, if you're coming back into understanding Jung's modulus and Poisson's ratio, you know, if you're talking about plastic, plasticity and elasticity, Dion, and how those materials behave, then, um, you know, it, it, it's critical in the sense that if you push that material um, beyond its um, elastic region, that it's not going to return to, um, you know, its original state, therefore it's deformed and you won't be able to reuse that particular piece of material. Um, but within this piece of apparatus, the, the actual um, material used is not deformed beyond its elastic limit um, and then allows you to do therefore repeatable results so yeah okay. so you're not having to change the specimen over it's no that that's right that piece yeah. of plastic that you're using um, that is consistent for all your experiments yes that's correct right so we're back to bearings we are so um the mitchell pad apparatus um the it's quite interesting again we will continue our discussion in, thing, in things like hydrodynamic lift um, and the phenomena that's involved with that and this really provides students with an understanding of things like the Reynolds number um, and how uh, the pressure gradient in a fluid film um, could be related between the sliding speed or maybe the oil viscosity and pressure distribution um, it's a hydrodynamic measuring instrument and that's utilized typically in bearings or maybe in mechanical seals. Um, if you're familiar with how a mechanical seal may operate. Um, and the tilting applications are ideal for maybe where trains uh, as well are utilized or require bearings because of the high speed and pressure that these can be subjected to um, and getting up to operating speed. Um, so yeah, quite a, a nice tidy little bench top piece of apparatus to be honest, Dion, and understanding how um, obviously bearings operate. So what's going on here in this piece of equipment? Um, just to explain a bit more detail, we've got the, the green section through the middle. Yeah, so I you apply... About it, so I can't yeah. help. No, you, you apply a load, Dion, and then that effectively allows you to then uh, measure the hydrodynamic lift using the instrumentation um, and obviously then um, you can understand that relationship between how that uh, fluid film um, is then creating the different Reynolds numbers and also pressure gradients um, from the readings that you take. Great, good, good, good. This one's quite a tall piece of equipment. We had one in the factory just before lockdown that I was hoping to film but uh, lockdown prevented me getting that far. Yeah so the it, effectively what you can see on that backboard is a manometer um, and that allows you to understand and take readings in regards to pressure points um, at, at different contact areas in regards to the, the, the journal bearing below. Um, so it's utilized to demonstrate how the effect of the more important variables such as speed, viscosity, load um, and pressure distribute across a bearing. Um, and funnily enough, something that was the Osborne Reynolds then started to investigate. Um, Sommerfeld, another scientist that went on to investigate theory and evolve uh, from a more analytical sense, that investigation. Um, of how journal bearings operate and um, um, yeah it's quite a complex area really to try and investigate effectively um, and as mentioned Sommerfeld is one theory demonstrated and students investigate the pressure function 
to the actual pressure distribution in an oil film. Um, where would you see uh, maybe journal bearings utilised in real world applications would be in a dry gas seal, uh, where separating bearing oil, for example, um, and dry gas used in trans, you know, even either in maybe gas transmission or um, chemical processing plants is critical to ensure that there's no contaminant in there with the material that you're trying to transport. Um, so journal bearings are uh, used heavily in industry and this piece of equipment allows students to really investigate the theory of Sommerfeld um, in greater de detail, um, which is really the pressure function to the actual pressure distribution in an oil film, if that makes any sense. Yes. Thank you, Kyle. Okay, no problem. Brilliant. Uh, so we've covered bearings now. Um, we've not finished yet, so do stay watching us as we have a quick summary of what we've seen so far before we then move from bearings now on to looking at motion and the balancing of reciprocating masses. I like this piece of equipment um, on a very shallow level because it moves and it looks really cool, um, not from a kind of learning perspective level. You can tell us about that now, Kyle. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, it is, it's a brilliant piece of equipment and, um, you know, it would be great to see this in labs more often and from a, you know, understanding engines principle and, you know, automotive perspective, this is an absolutely excellent piece of kit. Um, so basically what you've got um, is a four cylinder combustion engine um, and it shows the principle of forces in a popular and common reciprocating machine. Um, when either in balanced or in unbalanced states and also how to maintain that balance. So an unbalanced engine, for example, um, could cause multiple issues uh, when in operation and typically from unwanted vibrations and resonance, um, you know, the old sort of Ford Escort, for example, that was renowned for, um, you know, particular parts shaking loose because of vibrations that were induced from, from the engine themselves um, and the level of resonance that it caused. Um, but obviously if you've got an unbalanced engine, um, that can cause issues that you perhaps weren't aware of in the design um, and therefore, you know, alter different effects as a result of that. Um, so, the, so basically, obviously noise level as well is another consideration. So um, diesel knock as well, um, that can affect things like the lifetime of the engine and its efficiency and um, its ability to deliver overall power and performance. Um, so in this particular piece of equipment, the student's able to measure the forces and moments from the engine as it vibrates. And uh, you can then also alter the mass and the inclination of the, um, of, of the cylinders themselves. So the timing effectively of how each cylinder, cylinder is timed. You can have them uh, synchronous or asynchronous. Um, and a, you can fit masses as well, individual masses to the top of the pistons um, and then measure the output and the forces as a result of the balanced or unbalanced configuration. So yeah, very straightforward piece of equipment, but very effective in demonstrating how um, the changes in um, balancing and unbalanced systems can affect the operation of an engine. We've got a nice video on that actually that we filled at Birmingham City University. They've got an automotive lab as well as their very generic lab that they use there, um, where it shows how you can see the pistons from the top going up and down and stuff, and you can see all the different configurations. So if you are more interested in that, then search for that on our YouTube channel or have a look on the website. But it also connects to VDAS, so we've got VDAS data there that we can uh, extract as well. Excellent. Sorry, Kyle, just take no, notes. No, not at all, not at all. No, it's great, it's great. Absolutely perfect. Um, yeah. And, yeah, no, I don't think no. about heat transfer, so that's definitely in your court. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from the fact we're... that I've got the fire on because it's freezing today. I've had to put oh. a wood burner on. Well, it's obviously emissivity and um, natural convection um, radiation, you know, cover a huge variety of different principles. And that, you know, could be from a physics perspective or, you know, very important from a HVAC, heating ventilation um, perspective. Um, so this particular unit uses a controlled heat source. Um, 
in a sealed vessel to study the heat transfer by natural convection and radiation at different pressures. Um, emissivity effectively is the measure of an object's ability to emit infrared energy. So emitted energy indicates um, the temperature of the object and emissivity usually generally has a value from zero. So that may be, it may be something like a shiny mirror, for example, um, or a um, black body, which would be 1.0. So yeah, absolutely. Um, but most organic or perhaps pointed or oxidized surfaces have emissivity values close to things like 0.95. Um, so really it's about obviously emitted energy um, and the temperature of the object itself. And this piece of equipment simulates that very nicely, allowing the students to understand how the different states in the surface temperature are affected as you increase the heated element power. And you can extract that information into our VDAS software, um, organize and collate a series of results and plot that against the graphs that you want to create and understand the different types of materials and how that affects the surface radiation. So Kyle, because I, again, another piece of equipment I don't know a whole lot about, do you put different materials inside of this unit or are you supplied with different pieces of mater different materials to look at and analyze? Yeah. yeah, so there's different materials that you can provide, that you can input into the, into the equipment. Um, and obviously then um, you put those under varying different pressures and right. can understand how those materials react under that, those different pressures and environment. Okay, and could you uh, test something that you've made in the lab, you know, your student might have made something and you want to test the overall emissivity of it, would that be possible or? Yeah, I mean, I would have thought so, to be honest with you, I mean, I, I, I don't see why not. Um, uh, yeah, obviously it depends on the material type and the chamber, um, but yeah, I would have thought so. Sorry, I put you on the spot there. No, it's okay. Good question. Uh, moving on, film-wise and drop-wise, condensation and boiling. Yeah, so um, building again on the heat, the sort of heat uh, and transfer study and thermodynamics um, by convection, conduction and radiation. Um, this focuses really purely on convection um, and really allows students to understand perhaps how a domestic kettle operates or a hot water immersion tank um, also you know it, and it ref sort of shows the different regimes of, of pool boiling as they call it um, and heat transfer of water condensing on different surfaces effectively and allows you to then obviously take those readings and take them into the data acquisition software um, the understanding the y dimensions um, calculated parameters such as the heat transfer in power and obviously the resistance that's required within the system and the resist resistivity if i could get it out um, um, but yeah no overall it's a really useful straightforward piece of equipment that effectively demonstrates how um, different properties behave in that environment that asked what nucleate boiling is. Nucleate boiling. Um, it's something to be honest, Dion, it's something to do with how the um, uh, how the transfer of um, atoms between um, different states occur. I can't remember exactly the term, um, but I know that there's pool boiling, which again is more of like a um, open environment and I think nuclear boiling is, is separate but I can't remember to be honest with you the exact term on that one so yeah well um, I think perhaps I, I should have just looked in the manual because with all of the products like this you get the manual and then you'll get the theory which will include which will explain things like nuclear boiling and film boiling in there ready for the academics if you're like Kyle and you're feeling a little um, sketchy on the topic uh, you can well, always back to the manual yeah well i can tell you that it's basically uh nuclear boiling um it, it's caused uh the bulk well it causes the bulk temperature rise um to the saturated temperature and uh, large bubbles form effectively um on the heating element and their movement then agitates the water uh, these large bubbles rise and break the liquid surface and 
this is the nuclear boiling regime. Um, so yeah, they generally try and utilize the nuclear boiling regime to obviously generate the heat transfer because that's when it's working most effectively. Does that give a bit of a, an indication as to perhaps what it is? We had slightly sketchy internet issues there. So I, I heard part of it. I think uh, the audience may have heard part of it. It sounds like what's happening in a kettle. It is effectively. So if you imagine what's the behavior of the, of the uh, molecules around um, a heating element effectively. Um, so as you can see those bubbles being, those larger bubbles being created, that's nuclear boiling. Um, it's when the, 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 the boiling point effectively um, is rising um, to the saturated temperature and um, yeah, larger bubbles form on the element, so. Brilliant, thank you again. Well done for, uh, as I put you on the spot there on that yeah, one. I did that back to you then, Dion. Yeah, you did, you did. You left me with bad internet and I was sat there uh, trying to think about how I might feel that moment. <laughs> We've been talking about feeling a bit unsteady and internet unsteady. We talk about unsteady state heat transfer. Yeah, so, um, Obviously, on steady state heat transfer, understanding um, steady state um, transfer is, is important, essentially. Um, so steady state conditions, uh, the temperature within the system doesn't change with time. However, conversely, under unsteady state conditions, the temperature within the system does vary with time. Um, so heat transfer is the transfer of, of thermal energy from a body, uh, high temperature to another at a low temperature and the thermal equilibrium is required to ensure energy can be transferred from one body to the next and explores really the, the obviously laws within thermodynamics. This is a great piece of equipment that allows students to investigate different material bodies, different material types, um, so different designs. You've got cylindrical, spherical, flat, surfaces and uh, different surface areas and how that affects um, the heat transfer in these conditions and again with the thermocouples that are provided you can then take that data and plot it within the VDAS system. There we go. Yeah. Right. Got no VDAS on that one. <laughs> Never mind. Um, so the Peltier effect and Seebeck effect, we talked briefly about this. Um, so the Peltier effect is effectively the reverse of the Seebeck effect. Um, it's where the electrical current um, flowing through the junction connecting two materials um, emits or absorbs heat um, per unit time. Um, and at that junction, uh, the balance to the different uh, chemical potential of the two materials has an impact on how that material then behaves uh, and whether it creates uh, heat generation or a um, reduction in heat. And it also highlights to students really the importance of how different semiconductor materials operate and function and their behaviour in different states. Um, so typically it, this kind of technology is used in both refrigeration and power generation. Um, and you can generally contain it within the same module as you can see in this unit here. Um, and really energy conversions that you know are compact, there's no moving parts um, and any heating or cooling is, is, is localized to the system. So you can see a nice little diagram where you've got active cooling there on the right hand side. Um, and then you've got heat rejection um, with, in refrigeration mode. And then you've got power generation mode where you've effectively got a resistor and a heat sink and um, the um, heat source at the top and cooling at the bottom effectively. So yeah, that's the Peltier thermoelectric couple. And that's obviously demonstrated very effectively in the Seebeck and Paltier piece of equipment, the TD-1008. Um, and again, you can extract your information via the VDAS software and allow students to understand how those results change under different environment settings. So humidity measurement, um, the TE6, um, 
this piece of equipment is obviously very important in understanding wet and dry bulb um, function in regards to humidity measurement, um, understanding psychometric charts, that kind of thing, um, and getting to grips with the theory of humidity. And when in the real world would you want to be, you know, why is this so important? Yeah, so humidity obviously um, this is basically measuring the water content within um, the atmosphere um, and obviously multiple applications in regards to where you may um, want to understand, you know, um, the humidity. Um, but obviously this really allows students to, from a sort of um, thermodynamics perspective, um, understand the, the, the measurements that are required and the steps that you take to taking humidity measurements. Um, so humidity is particularly obviously important when designing maybe a HVAC, a heating and ventilation system. Right, okay, great, thank you. Um, which brings us nicely on to going with the flow and understanding flow. Yeah, so um, we talked before and there's been quite a common theme in regards to the boundary layer. Um, and, and the importance of, you know, that within flow and the different effects that they can have. Um, so the winglets and end plates, these are used within the AF1300, which is our subsonic um, th 300 mil by 300 mil cross-section, um, working cross-section wind tunnel, um, the AF1300Q. And these winglets are vertical extensions, effectively. You can see on that image there, uh, the tip of a wing, and they improve an aircraft's fuel efficiency um, at, at cruising range. Um, and they're effectively designed as additional small aerofoils, and they reduce, at the end of an aircraft's wing, the aerodynamic drag associated with the vortices uh, that develop at wingtips as the plane moves through the air. So this again would then, um, you know, have a, a benefit in regards to when a plane lands, for example, because um, if you run your, perhaps if you run your hand through a river and you see swirling, uh, the swirling of the water, the, they're called eddies. Um, the same thing happens effectively in the air at the tip of a wing. Um, and that's the turbulent airflow um, that's caused as the air moves over a wing and these effectively allow um, that airflow to be more controlled, less turbulent um, and therefore when a plane's landing, the plane that's, that's coming behind it, the, the airflow is a lot more steady um, and therefore um, it's a lot safer for that plane to land. So yeah, they're quite um, unique uh, in, in their application, but you see them quite often now nowadays, particularly in the newer aircraft um, to help in regards to efficiencies um, and obviously behaviors of the airflow around a wing. Um, so yeah, uh, it, it's, it's, yeah. That's pretty much it on, on that. The end plates, again, it's pretty much a, a petty foggery. Um, I, I quite like that word. Uh, so you can call them winglets or end plates. It's up to you, really. Um, but it, yeah, it allows you to um, sort of extend to both sides of the wing. And, you know, really, while wing paints, wing, winglets point up and are only larger, um, you know, there's not really much exception to the rule in that sense. Um, but yeah, obviously you can see those in that picture there. Um, a nice little image as well, again, with the fluid flow visualization for the AF-80. Um, there's multiple ancillaries that are available with this piece of equipment. And again, allows students to quite easily visualize how that fluid flow is moving around that object and how that turbulent flow, as we discussed before, um, in regards to um, obviously the winglets is being created. You can see at the back end of that image, um, the flow that's starting to turn back in on itself and obviously create that turbulent flow. So yeah, nice little unit, the AF80 for clear flow visualization. So we oh. move on to Who's the... And it would make sure I remind everybody what they've missed if they've joined late. This is a this is a quick brief preview of what you've missed. You can re-watch this. Um, but now we can understand process control. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, process control, um, obviously, this is a very heavy industry sort of focused um, piece of equipment, um, allows students to really um, get to grips with how obviously industry utilise um, pressure transmitters, transducers, um, take readings, monitor, you know, the presence of, of combustible gases in production, for example of storage areas during emissions or pollution control um, and controlling flow in delivery systems um, and pressure vessels. So this particular piece of equipment can be connected up to the TE37DCS which is um, our computer controlled software that complements this piece of equipment um, and it's critical really in understanding how industrial plants operate and are controlled and can be done so using that software remotely as well. Um, so yeah, quite a, quite a good versatile piece of equipment that obviously is very critical in regards to oil and gas applications in the real world. Brilliant. And that brings us to uh, a close on that. Um, thank you very much, Carl. I want to remind everybody who's watching this live, you, you can ask questions. Obviously today we've only covered the more uncommon theory. So these are just snippets of pieces of practical teaching equipment from across the ranges uh, for tech equipment. Do check back at our other live streamed events for more details on what we offer for theory of machines, etc. But uh, Kyle, perhaps in a few minutes, you can take us a quick whiz through the ranges. But before we yeah, do no, that, I'm, I'm gonna give you a bit of a break. Um, and I'm going to tell those people who don't know much about tech equipment a bit about who we are, what we're doing to, to support people with the remote learning. Um, and then Kyle to, can tell you about the other ranges of products that we offer that we have touched upon already here today. So about tech equipment, if you don't know who we are and what we're all about, uh, we are a, a UK designer and manufacturer of engineering teaching equipment. We supply to universities and colleges and even industry all around the world in more than 100 companies within more than 1200 different organizations. Uh, we design everything and manufacture all under one roof. As a company, yes, what we do is we, we design and manufacture this stuff, but it's about creating the best products for practical teaching of engineering principles and creating real life understanding that, in, that matches the skills needed for what the, um, the market, the employer, to improve their employability, about creating greater levels of empathy and appreciation for the topics in discussion. The products themselves, and I know this is a bit product centric now, but it's important to cover the fact that there are certain principles that we keep in mind when we're designing and enhancing products. Number one is fostering curiosity and sparking passion. That's what we are about. Um, number two is it needs to be able to stand the test of time. We do offer a five year warranty with all of our products, but many products will go on to live much longer than, it, than it's five years. We've got equipment that is still in use back from the 1960s, uh, which is testament for the support and the kind of materials and the design processes that we adopt. Uh, so we're very stringent in the suppliers that we choose, the materials that we select, uh, and the actual manufacturing process that we follow within our factory in the UK. When we are designing and we're enhancing, we're looking at how can we make uh, engineering teaching equipment perform faster, but still retain all the learning outcomes so that you can utilize your lab time. Uh, I think with as we're looking at um, socially distanced labs coming up, lab time and utilizing that most effectively will become more and more important. With every uh, teaching equipment comes manuals and instructional material theory. So if you want to know about Poisson's ratio or you don't know what a nucleate boiling point <laughs> boiling is, it will already be in the manual for you to cover. Um, so it's ready there to share with the students. And it's very much got functionality that matches your syllabus requirements. We're constantly working with academics around the world to match the changing of syllabus. Uh, and that's something that we've been looking at in terms of COVID-19. And we've got some uh, exciting news that will be coming up in a few weeks time. Um, I shouldn't say a few weeks, in the very near future about that. So watch this space. 
that's a bit of an overview about us. We're 63 years old. If you want to know about the wonderful story of how it all began, you can check it out on our website, but I shall not um, cover that for you today. Before we talk about Rangers overview, I'd like to talk about remote learning support. The COVID-19 situation is having a massive impact on educators and students all around the world. We are very busy uh, in terms of how we provide and support and deliver material to help you with your teaching, whether that's um, providing tips on create, creating videos. We've got a short video on YouTube that will give you a step-by-step -step guide on how to create lab experiment videos. We've also got various other resources on a dedicated area on our website, including a PDF video guide that will show you various video content, not from tech, necessarily from tech equipment, but out there in the world to help enhance your online remote learning content. That includes student experiment videos. We've got a student competition playlist on YouTube. I'd encourage you to go and check that out for uh, actual videos of students using the kit, proving pieces of theory, testing them, etc. We also have various online communities. We have the LinkedIn and Facebook practical teaching and engineering education communities. They are for academics to share ideas and thoughts. Then we have a generic community on YouTube for anybody who wants to participate in a public discussion and uh, post polls, etc. I have mentioned it before, we are working on something very exciting uh, that will assist with remote learning support and blended learning. So, uh, but I can't tell any more than that. My lips are sealed, but we will be talking about that, making that public in the very, very near future. So do watch this space, share us, um, follow us on social media and you will get the latest update there. So that's me finished for the moment. Kyle, do you have a few minutes to talk about all the ranges for us? Yeah, no problem. Like race through them. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. You start with engineering science. Engineering science. Okay, here we go. So obviously um, a set of really foundation level slash undergraduate focused pieces of equipment that are the sort of stronghold in regards to future development and understanding of theory. And these are brilliant bench top pieces of equipment um, and allow students to run through the option of 66 in total different experiments. Everything comes with the worksheets that are available. Um, the full engineering science kit includes 18 different kits. Um, and yeah, it's a really good, useful piece of equipment that allows uh, academics to obviously fall back and, and rely on something that's really effective. Um, flu mechanics, we're, we're moving into, we've got things like our flumes, um, the H1F tank. So the H1F tank um, is really versatile again with diff 20 different ancillaries that allows you to really get to grips with flu mechanics, things like Bernoulli's theorem, um, uh, cavitation and also um, impact uh, you know, of a jet, that sort of thing. But flumes are brilliant, very, very versatile. Um, engines, and we've got a series of different engines that are available um, from petrol engines, uh, two-stroke um, petrol engines, uh, four-stroke engines, um, also within a dynamometer that's fixed there um, and regenerative engine test sets as well. So control engineering, um, moving into more um, obviously theory about control, PID, um, feedback systems. Um, we've got a set of equipment that obviously allows students very effectively to understand the importance of control. Um, process control, um, so pressure, temperature, level and flow. Um, that's the four uh, key points that you need to remember when looking at process control. And this piece of equipment really effectively demonstrates process control and allows you to work out and carry out practical in that sense. Electrical power systems. So obviously understanding the grid and grid distribution um, in regards to transmission. We have a series of um, pieces of equipment that can take you straight through from how the whole system operates um, as a, a full circle, or you can split that out into um, generators, 
um, power distribution, um, obviously energy storage, that kind of thing. So um, yeah, really quite a versatile piece of set of equipment within that range. Uh, materials testing, again, um, material testing. So we've got things like the SM1002 covering things like Young's modulus um, and um, Poisson's ratio, as we discussed before with the, the diaphragm apparatus um, and bending of beams. Uh, shear testing. So yeah, material testing, again, really fundamental to a student's understanding. Um, and we touched on the humidity control equipment. We then move into things like the environmental control um, and water to air heat exchanger um, that you can see there on display um, and allowing students to really get to grips from a um, HVAC um, perspective. taking its time, Dion. Yeah. Uh, so thermo, thermodynamics, that obviously we touched on thermodynamics today within some of the unique pieces of equipment that we spoke about. Um, in front of us, we've got a Marseille boiler, um, which obviously touches on, um, you know, the principles of heat and work um, and, and saturated steam. Um, and uh, we also have the TD360, which looks at heat transfer as well from a thermodynamics perspective. Structures, obviously from a civil engineering perspective, um, understanding how perhaps um, simply supported beams operate. Um, you've got a variety of different equipment such as um, the um, pinned um, jointed framework, which is demonstrating perhaps how a roof truss uh, would uh, behave in regards to compression and tension. And again, you've got the structure software there on the right hand side, which gives you another um, option to obviously discuss and share information with students, whether that's in the lab or remotely online. Um, so then we move into our VDAS, which is our versatile, versatile data acquisition system um, or software. And this really obviously allows you to integrate the, so the solid hardware component, the equipment into the software that we already spoke about. Um, and as you can see there, there's an image of a creep tester that is interfacing with the hardware and the laptop itself. Moving into the solar or renewable package that we provide, looking at thermal um, heat transfer, um, solar energy in regards to solar cell, and also the um, obviously solar focus equipment there. So yeah, the solar side really effective in demonstrating various different principles for renewable energy sources. And um, aerodynamics, so we've got three uh, wind tunnels that we provide from a subsonic point of view, the AF1300, AF1450 and AF1600. Um, and um, these are really effective in demonstrating and investigating uh, subsonic flow. Um, and the other side of things is obviously the supersonic flow and we offer um, a intimate and continuous flow or two even two different types of supersonic flow apparatus. Theory of machines, um, so this is all about things like gyroscopes, um, how they operate, um, how you can understand gyroscopic theory for example, um, centrifugal forces, um, a vibration of machines two degrees of freedom with the TEM, the TM1016, and again, obviously integrating that into the VDAS software. And breathe. Thank you, Kyle. We really did whiz through You're that welcome. today. It was uh, fantastic. Great job there. Uh, now, before we wrap up, I do want to remind you that we've got just a couple of minutes if you want to ask any of your questions to Kyle. While you are thinking of those questions, uh, don't worry, because if you think of them half an hour later, you can post them in the comment box and we'll come back to you. But if you want instant results, instant response from Kyle, now's the time to ask it. Yeah. Um, so while you're getting thinking, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the Tech Equipment Student Competition. Uh, as part of our activity to be more of a holistic partner in helping educators engage engineering students, we run Tech Equipment Sponsored Student Competitions. Uh, so if you're interested in getting involved, getting your students involved in 
creating videos, uh, testing theory, being part of this competition, um, a, a global wide competition where we go head to head against other teams and other universities, then do get in contact with me. We have a dedicated playlist on YouTube for student competitions with an introduction about the, uh, about the concept. We've got videos from there from other previous entrants. And we also have a summary of the whole competition that we did with Nottingham Trent University about a month ago. Uh, we've also, if you're interested in learning more about what the perceptions are in terms of practical teaching in the engineering education industry worldwide, you may also like to check out the report and the survey that we did in 2018 and 2019. Here is a very quick summary of some of the findings. Um, one of those, and I believe it will still very much stay, stay true in terms of the COVID-19 situation as we speak to ac academics. 90% of academics believe that practical learning is extremely important for student employability. Now the challenge is, how can you do that socially distanced in the current situation? How can you overcome um, the real engagement challenge? Uh, I would encourage you maybe to check out the Q&A live that we had with um, CU Coventry and Cardiff University yesterday. Some great perspectives there of how they're achieving their socially distanced learning and remote learning. Uh, we also had Trafford College with us a couple of weeks ago talking about how they managed to do it as well uh, as we all navigate through this very um, uncertain times. Uh, we must all think of different scenarios um, and be prepared. And again, we'll have more news on how tech equipment is going to be working to support you with new news in, a, in the very near future. Right, questions. Everybody's a little quiet on the question front, Kyle, today. It is. Have you got any, deal? Oh, well, I bombarded you throughout. I think I've made you sweat enough, frankly. You did. Nuclear, nuclear boiling. I should have known that one. That was quite straightforward. I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh, it takes so me back to GCSE level, that did. I totally forgot. I think I'm going to have to do some science experiment with my kids this afternoon to teach them about new yeah. Definitely. Fantastic, Kyle. Thank you so much today. I personally have found it absolutely fascinating. Um, and I hope everybody who's watching this live and watching it on demand has uh, found it maybe just a, a little bit fascinating. If it's been wonderfully fascinating, that's even better. If you do like it, then maybe put a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe because we are throwing out new content on YouTube all the time. Live streams, ways to interact. Uh, don't miss it by subscribing and clicking the notification bells when we do have a live stream listed. Coming up next week, we have, uh, we have Roger Penlington from Northumbria University. Roger is going to be talking about COVID-19 and blended learning. Uh, so we're looking forward to speaking to him then. We will not have a webinar and that is because we are working on our very exciting project, which you will hear about very, very soon. The following week after Roger Penlington on the Q&A, every Wednesday we run these Q&As, which will run throughout July. We have our uh, group of our sales partners from the USA. They're talking about a survey that they did with academics in the USA to see how they're responding to uh, minimizing risk in labs during COVID-19. So we'll be finding more out about those survey results and thoughts on the industry there. So don't forget to put those dates in your diary, Wednesday the 15th for Roger Pendlington from Northumbria University, and Wednesday the 23rd, where we'll be talking about uh, the survey looking at the US education market. Then in between that, we will be looking forward to sharing more news about our exciting project. Thank you for watching. Thank you very much, Kyle. Thank and you. See you again next time. Thank you.